Hello there. Today I'm going to be talking about reference-based multiple imputation for clinical trials, what the right variance is and how to estimate it. So this work was supported by a UK Medical Research Council grant and I'm thankful to them for their support. So these are the uh, topic headings in my talk today. I'm going to introduce reference-based multiple imputation, talk a little bit about the issue of congeniality and variance estimation for these methods, then uh, discuss the um, debate about what the right variance for reference-based multiple imputation is. I'll then talk a little bit about how to estimate the repeated sampling variance of reference-based MI estimators, and then give a, a small number of simulation results. And then I'll have some concluding thoughts at the end. Okay, so let's introduce reference-based multiple imputation. So consider a randomized trial with repeated measurements of the outcome variable over the follow-up time. I'm going to assume that the estimand or treatment effect of interest is the difference in the mean outcomes between the randomized treatment groups. And I mean the actual outcomes, not, for example, some hypothetical outcomes, assuming full compliance, between the treatment groups at the final follow-up visit. Now, randomized trials often have missing data caused by a variety of things, and sometimes patients may withdraw from the trial, leading to uh, outcome data being missing because of their withdrawal from the trial. And that withdrawal often also comes alongside the patients um, discontinuing their randomized treatment. In those sorts of situations, the missing at random assumption is then not typically deemed to be plausible, particularly for the patients in the active treatment arm. An increasingly popular alternative in this context to an MAR-based analysis is to use reference-based multi imputation as first proposed by Carpenter et al. in 2013. Reference-based imputation methods use in, in different ways, depending on the variant of reference-based imputation, uh, the reference group, or typically the control group, to help impute the missing data in patients randomized to the active treatment group. So the analysis model in these sorts of trials is going to be a final uh, regression model of the outcome at the final time point with treatment and baseline as covariates. And the estimates and standard errors from those regression models fitted to each of the imputed data sets are combined using Rubin's rules. Now, since reference-based model computation was first proposed, a number of researchers found that the Rubin's rules variance estimator overestimated the repeated sampling variance of the reference-based multiple imputation estimate of the treatment effect itself, the point estimate of the treatment effect. That overestimation leads to the type 1 error rate being controlled at levels below the nominal level, so for example 5%, and, and when there is a treatment effect, power being reduced relative to if the true repeated sampling variance of the point estimator were used. The cause of the upward bias in Rubin's variance estimator is uncongeniality between the reference-based imputation model and the complete or full data analysis model. Okay, so just to say a little bit more about the nature of this uncongeniality. So the linear regression uh, model that fit, that's fitted to the completed or imputed data sets, the variance estimator from that linear regression model doesn't recognize or know that the point estimator uh, has been made more precise as a result of the reference-based assumption. And one way of seeing what the problem is with the complete data variance estimator is to consider what happens when the proportion of missingness in the active arm increases towards one, so increases towards everybody in the active arm uh, having their outcome missing. In this uh, obviously uh, slightly contrived case, the jump to reference multiple imputation, which is one variety of reference-based multiple imputation, the effect estimate from jump to reference effectively goes to uh, zero with zero repeated sampling variance of those estimates because if everyone in the active arm is missing and they're roughly speaking imputed using whatever the control arm mean is, the difference between uh, the, the two uh, means and the two randomized groups uh, will, will go to zero. So the treatment effect magnitude uh, will go to zero, and the variance of that, the true repeated sampling variance of that, will go to zero. But the linear regression complete data variance estimate that you use uh, as, as a, a, rest, a part of the recipe for Rubin's variance will not go to zero. And so the Rubin's variance estimator will uh, not go to zero, even when the true repeated sampling variance of the um, 
jump to reference estimator does go to zero. Now, obviously, this is a very sort of high level argument for what's going on. If you're interested in, in looking into some of the more de some more of the details, um, pl please see the preprint here given as reference one. Okay, so given um, this difference between Rubin's variance estimator and the repeated sampling variance of the uh, point estimate of the treatment effect for these methods, let's talk a little bit about, about what the right variance is uh, when using reference-based computation. Now, it obviously uh, is an important thing to, to discuss and, and come up with a decision on because it can make a big practical difference in real trials. So some authors have argued that the repeated sampling or frequentist variance should be used since this is what's needed for correct type 1 error control. Also, since the repeated sampling variance is typically smaller than Rubin's variance estimator for these analyses, using the repeated sampling variance also gives higher statistical power. In contrast, some others have argued for Rubin's rules to be used, despite the um, discrepancy between Rubin's rules and the repeated sampling variance of the point estimate, or point estimator, I should say. So Carpenter et al. Um, suggested that for missing data sensitivity analyses, the variance that you use should be no lower on average than the complete data variance estimator, i.e. the one that you would have obtained had there not been any missing data in your trial. And they showed that jump to reference multiple imputation, if you use the repeated sampling variance, it would violate this principle. My argument in response to that idea is that it violates this seemingly sensible principle because the reference-based methods make very strong assumptions about the missing data uh, in the active treatment group. A logical consequence of the assumptions made by reference-based multiple imputations is that with more missing data, you are paradoxically more certain about the magnitude of the treatment effect than you would have been with less missing data. If that behavior doesn't seem right to you, I think it probably means you don't really believe the assumption being made in the reference-based multiple imputation approach that you're using. A little bit more recently, um, Crow et al. in 2019 proposed an information anchoring principle. Information is the reciprocal of the variance of an estimate, and Crow et al. argued that the ratio of the information in the primary analysis, given the observed data, for example, using an assumption of missing at random, to what that information would be had you had full data, should be the same in a sensitivity analysis, for example, which might be performed using reference-based multiple imputation. So, um, here, the ratio, if we're going to use um, missing at random as our sort of primary assumption, the ratio of the information under missing at random, given the observed data, to um, the information had we observed full data, should be the same when we do our sensitivity analysis. So namely, our sensitivity analysis shouldn't bias um, or lose us information relative to our primary missing data assumption, which might be uh, missing at random in a particular trial. So in the context of sensitivity analyses for missing data, Crow et al. argue that information anchoring is a sensible principle to preserve. And it does indeed seem reasonable that when you do a sensitivity analysis for missing value assumptions, you're, you're deviating uh, or changing the assumptions you're making about the missing data, but, but maybe that makes sense to do that in a way that doesn't um, inject information. They showed that if for delta-based multiple imputation and reference-based multiple imputation, if you use Rubin's rules for inference, this information anchoring property is essentially satisfied. But in this principle, they take information and variance to be the estimated variance rather than the repeated sampling variance. And the way I, I view this uh, question is that if you're using reference-based multiple imputation with Rubin's rules, it amounts to acting as if you have not added or taken away information when you really have, at least in, if you um, judge information by repeated sampling variance. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how to estimate the repeated sampling variance when you're using repeated um, uh, reference-based multiple imputation methods. So how can we estimate the, re the true repeated sampling variance? So there's been a number of proposals for analytical estimators of the variance based on um, asymptotic methods like the delta method. There's a couple of reference here, references here. These are very nice, but one drawback of them is that they tend to be quite complex and very model specific. So just to give you uh, uh, an illustration, this is a, a, a screenshot from 
um, a paper by Tang in 2017, which was um, deriving um, asymptotic variance estimators for um, reference-based MI for repeated measures, repeated continuous measures. Um, and this slide is, is merely supposed to show you what it, it works out as being quite complicated. It's, it's not going to be a simple uh, expression. It's going to be very problem specific. So a possible alternative approach for variance estimation is to use bootstrapping. Now, because of the uncongeniality, it turns out that it's really crucial uh, when you're combining bootstrapping with multiple imputation, that you first do the bootstrapping and then apply multiple imputation to each of the bootstrap samples in order to get valid inferences under uncongeniality. Reference-based MI uh, is an example of an uncongenial setting, and so it's important that we first do the bootstrapping and then we do imputations on the bootstrap samples. Now, you need quite a lot of bootstraps to get accurate inferences, typically, many more generally than uh, might be used for the number of imputations in multiple imputation. And then if, I, if we're saying that each of these bootstraps has to be imputed lots of times, this procedure where we combine bootstrapping and multiple imputation can become slow and computationally burdensome. So an alternative version of combining bootstrapping and multiple imputation uh, was prop proposed by um, von Hippel and myself in a paper referenced here. And it's an approach where you bootstrap the um, observed data and then impute each of the bootstrap samples a small number of times, and we recommended just two. After doing that, you analyze each of the imputed data sets. And remember here that the imputed data sets are nested within um, uh, bootstrap samples. You can then sit at, fit a simple one-way analysis of variance or random intercepts model to the resulting estimates of your parameter of interest to estimate the between bootstrap and within bootstrap variances. And you can use that to estimate the variance of the overall estimate. Now, because you're not relying on Rubin's rules, the imputation process doesn't have to be so-called proper. So normally in multiple imputation, um, there's a step involved, and some kind, sometimes this requires MCMC processes to take draws from the posterior distribution of the imputation model parameters. Because in this bootstrap approach, we're not relying on Rubin's rules, we don't actually need to do that imputation uh, posterior draw step. We can do so-called improper imputation. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly show some simulation results for a recurrent event setting. So I've got a sample size here of 1,000 patients, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to control or active treatment groups. The outcome is a recurrent event count over a follow-up of 365 days generated from a negative binomial model. The event rate in the control arm was 0.01, and then the active arm was 0.05, giving a rate ratio under full compliance to the uh, treatments of 0.5, or a log rate ratio of minus 0.69. I then... Um, generated some dropout or um, withdrawal from the study completely at random, so unrelated to the patient's data, with the individual's dropout time, a draw from an exponential distribution, either with a rate of 0.3025 or 0.2025. After imposing the dropout, I then used a copy reference multiple imputation approach with Rubin's rules and 10 imputations, or copy reference imputation using the von Hippel bootstrap approach with 200 bootstraps and two imputations per bootstrap. The R code for these simulations can be found at GitHub at the link below. So briefly, these are the results. The estimates here are means over a thousand simulations. I've got these two scenarios where I uh, have a, a low amount of dropout. So in the, in the first scenario, 91% um, of the patients complete their follow-up. Uh, as intended. And in the second scenario, just 40% of the patients complete their follow-up. In the first column, I've got the average log rate ratio estimate. Now, this differs from the, um, slightly in the first case, from the uh, log rate ratio here of minus 0.69. And this is because um, in the imputation process, we're using this copy reference assumption, which is imputing the missing data in the active group patients um, using the estimated conditional distribution from the control arm. And so we see a dilution in the magnitude of the treatment effect. Here, with uh, relatively small amounts of uh, dropout, we see just a slight difference. In the scenario where we have a much greater proportion of patients dropping out early, we see a greater dilution in the treatment effects towards the null.
The second column shows the empirical standard error of the log rate ratio estimates. And you can see here that uh, this is uh, the behavior we were, I was mentioning earlier, that with uh, more missing data, the, the true repeated sampling variance of, in this case, a copy reference multiple imputation estimator is actually going down the more missing data there are. Okay, so this is really what's happening to the behavior, the repeated sampling behavior of the treatment effect point estimates. Um, the estimated standard error, so this here is based on Rubin's rules, and this is based on um, the von Hippel bootstrap approach. And the last column shows the ratio of the um, mean of the estimated standard errors to the mean of the empirical standard errors. So with a relatively small amount of missing data, we see that Rubin's rules here is giving us a, a slight 8% increase uh, in, in the estimated variance relative to the empirical variance of the point estimates. But if we go to this um, admittedly quite extreme scenario where 40, only 40% 40 of the patients complete their follow-up, the Rubin's rules variance estimator is now, uh, the standard error estimator, I should say, is now 50% larger than the empirical standard errors on average. Whereas the bootstrap approach is essentially giving us unbiased estimates of the standard error. So in practice, uh, you know, these differences, uh, in practice, you probably have a scenario somewhere between these two. For example, um, using Rubin's rules uh, variance estimator is gonna have a potentially material impact on the statistical power of the clinical trial. Okay, so just to conclude then, Rubin's rules variance can be materially larger than the repeated sampling variance of the point estimate for treatment uh, effect use it when you're using reference-based multiple imputation methods. I believe that the repeated sampling variance is the right one if we're operating in the frequentist paradigm. Combining bootstrapping with multiple imputation, I think is an attractive approach if you're interested in getting at the repeated sampling variance, if you're using reference-based multiple imputation. Now, if the behavior of reference-based multiple imputation with repeated sampling variance is, if you deem that inappropriate, so if you don't like the idea that as you get more missing data, um, you're more certain about the magnitude of the treatment effect, I believe the correct response to that is to formulate alternative assumptions and estimation methods, which don't have that characteristic but instead have the, the desired characteristics. For more details uh, about what I've been talking about here today, um, please have a look at the preprint available as reference one here. And for the um, simulations in R, the packages are available for doing the bootstrap. So the Von Hippel bootstrap method is available in this boot impute uh, package. And um, reference-based multiple imputation for recurrent event data uh, can be performed in R using the deja vu package. Okay, so I'm just going to conclude uh, here by showing you the reference list. Thank you.